Fingers type out a quote on their system and add a name tag, Adam Lewell, writer. On second thought, the writer is erased and replaced with, failed writer, which they are more satisfied with. The song split personality by Mike and the censorship is still vibing through when the first introduction scene starts to take place. Tracy wakes a snoring Adam, dozed off at the dining table with his laptop probed up. She shuts the laptop and places a plate of toasts in front of him, commenting that he was up at night. He relays he got writer's block yet again, and she takes away a bowl of a finished meal she would prefer he stops having, as her take is that the meal is unhealthy. Adam jokes the meal is addictive like cigarettes and they might be gearing him up for actual cigarettes. Tracy's response to the joke is a little apprehensive and Adam picks on it, stating he's just trying to make a living. Tracy is quiet for a moment and comments on the fact that he got apprehensive first. It's something that happens more often between them and Adam defends he just wants to be able to take her to a nice restaurant. She jokes that their current status should assure him she's not with him for his money, but Adam proves he does get apprehensive first, and Tracy remarks they used to laugh over their jokes. Adam admits he's moody and apologizes after Tracy promises that she believes in his potential to finish his book. He calls her his only true supporter and hands a note apologizing in advance. Tracy accepts the note and gives Adam an affectionate kiss. She moves around, trying to add finishing touches to her appearance before stepping out for work. Adam is, however, not done with the pity party, calling himself a failure ready to accept his fate. Tracy hides her exasperation and oblivious Adam asks if she'll need anything from the store as he plans to step out later. Tracy insists she would rather have him indoors writing, and he jokes about looking forward to her coming home to find him cleaning. Tracy clarifies the rubber gloves he puts on to clean are what she finds sexy, not the actual cleaning. He approaches her in a playful manner, stealing kisses and trying to initiate more. Tracy reminds him she has to go to work, and he missed his opportunity for intimacy the previous night when she alluded towards it. She emphasizes that he should stop getting distracted with house chores and work on his book during the day like he's supposed to. She finally steps out, calling out an affectionate I love you to him. Adam's dad leaves a voicemail informing him he's pulled some strings at the bank and gotten him a job interview at 10 in the morning the next day. Adam shows up at a business center with his laptop and manages to type down some words for his story while in the waiting room. He excitedly reads out what he has, and it catches the attention of a woman sharing the waiting space with him. She starts to reveal things she shouldn't know because they're strangers, like addressing him with his name and knowing he's writing a book drawing close to the last chapter. She claims to know everything about Adam and tries to prove it by stating an aspiration he has. They start to engage over a book by Hemingway. Little does he know that to any passerby, the woman is invisible, and he would appear as a nutcase talking to himself. She pulls out a notepad and starts to read out more facts about him, but he's initially convinced she must know this much from reading his blog. She reminds him only his parents read his blog and not enthusiastically either. He becomes utterly confused and asks her to introduce herself, and she replies that she's Nihility, or Emma, for endearments. Adam doesn't see how he can look past the conversation being a prank and questions Emma if his younger brother, John, put her up for the task. The fact that Emma already knows John is his younger brother, who is popular among the ladies, convinces Adam he's been set up. He starts to complain about his brother's success with women in contrast with his. He reveals he wouldn't mind being playboy material and Emma points out he doesn't even have the style to play the part. Adam can't see what's wrong with his appearance especially since his girlfriend, Tracy, doesn't complain about it. Emma happening to also know Tracy is the last straw for Adam, and he decides it's time to walk away from the madness. Emma follows him outside and remarks there isn't much time but would also like to inquire about the progress of his book. Adam relays his book is going fine but he closes off about further discussion. Adam takes his business to a coffee shop and Emma follows him there. He accuses her of being a stalker and she affirms. She calls herself a fan of all his unpublished works and opines the coffee place should be his top bottom for inspirational environment for writing. She asks why he's writing the book and he relents he's trying to catch his big break before time runs out. Emma's snarky interjections makes him spill about his aspiration to become a known writer. His first two novels flopped and now he's on the third, with not much faith, as he's starting to think no one really cares what he has to say. What's more is that he's basically been living off his more financially stable girlfriend, and he needs to finish his current work as a thank you for putting up with me award. Exasperated, he lets Emma know he's in no mood for mystery games as she still hasn't revealed how she knows so much about him, so he would prefer she goes away. She insists she's the Grim Reaper and pulls out her notepad to reveal a different level of sensitive information about him including birthmarks and social number. Adam starts to hesitate with his stance and decides he won't believe her until she does something more grim worthy than reading facts from a book. Challenge accepted, and a man named Mark from across them will pay the price. Emma captures Mark's attention, easy to do with her cream-colored skin and easy smile. Adam doesn't see how this proves anything, but Emma advises him to hang on as it usually takes a minute or two. 
Emma continues to engage Adam in conversation while using gestures to flirt with Mark. Adam looks up from his computer in time to see poor Mark suffering a heart attack before he drops to the floor. Adam's voice and eyes take a sharper edge even though he claims he still doesn't believe Emma. At some point, his full attention is on poor Mark who has attracted the concern of other people trying to revive him. Emma informs him Mark's time was up and Adam realizes Emma said a similar thing to him earlier. Piecing the scary puzzle of him being next, and she, being actually a reaper, sends him into panic mode, even slapping off her hand when she attempts to calm him. She reveals she doesn't have to chat with everyone that's about to kick the bucket and only pushed for an interaction because she was curious about him. This revelation distracts Adam from his building panic attack, making him wonder why she chose him to interact with when she could have gone for CEO Mark. Emma chides about how easily he got distracted from his fate on hearing a woman has picked a liking in him. Her remark successfully reminds him of his dreary reality, and he takes his laptop and hurries off. Adam only makes it as far as Unknown Street, sitting on a curb when Emma tauntingly catches up to him. He breathlessly reflects on how he hasn't done anything significant with his life and still has so much to achieve. Emma counters he's done everything he needs to and that's why his time is up. He somehow manages to calm down enough for Emma to get closer and explain his breakthrough will be posthumous. His girlfriend will have his work published after his passing and people will be drawn to it like they were drawn to similar authors that were taken in their prime. Emma assures him that Tracy will be a driving force, pushing it to critics that would positively accept it and blow it up on every top list. Adam asks if he can have an alternative of living to write more bestsellers but Emma explains he has just two options, gone and famous or alive and insignificant. Adam chooses life and Emma suddenly decides that's no longer an option. Adam suggests a game of chess or archery competition to decide his fate, and this leads to light talk about movies, before Emma asks for a stroll that leads to a park. Adam brings it up again, trying to reason he's not ready to go. Emma cheerily announces no one is ever ready, but Adam still feels the need to offload he was hoping to experience success. He opines there must be a loophole, hence why Emma was sent, and Emma's radiant smile reveals there just might be. The new deal becomes that she will pick someone and he will decide if the person should take his place in passing. This will be based on how much more worthy of life he feels over the person chosen. Adam agrees and Emma points at an oblivious mom and baby in the park. Adam stares at her incredulously, and Emma shrugs, stating she wasn't going to make it an easy pick. She clarifies her pick as the mom and Adam resolves why he can't selfishly let a baby become motherless. Emma is pleased with his decision, but Adam feels like he should get a different choice since he no longer has a say over the mother's life. Emma teases he'll have a second choice if they're able to keep up their newfound friendship. He promises to be more effective with his next chance at picking someone to take his place, and Emma coyly states she's enjoying spending time with him. They continue their walk and Emma wants Adam to explain why he's so hesitant to reach the end. He has a great deal with his biggest wish of being successful writer bound to come through, which is more than most people will get. Adam reiterates there must be a loophole to get out of the death sentence and he suspects that's why Emma is interacting with him. He questions what exactly he should expect in the other world and Emma mentions she's never been beyond the gates. She only escorts people there. Their stroll has taken them as far as a dwarf bridge over the river where Emma reflects on how selfish people have become, wanting to live for mostly themselves. Adam asks how she became a reaper, but Emma digresses. On the whim, she decides Adam's loophole would be to prove to her he's worthy to live. Adam calls her cynical and asserts there's a lot to live for. She counters that there's also a lot to end it all for, and his lifelong dream is possibly one of them. She asks him to reflect on the possibility of his life staying as it is, with everyone forging ahead. Still persevering, he asks about the job interview and possibly using the job to better his life. Emma sees a life that could be laced with never-ending work in a sector he won't be promoted in. Adam mentions his fear of hell, but Emma assures he'll have the company of other hell-bound writers which might be fun. They're back on the bustling streets. Emma has her hand hooked over Adam's arm, and Adam announces Tracy must be a valid answer as to what's worth living for. Emma scoffs that it took Adam long enough to mention Tracy as a reason, and Adam tries to play it as saving the best option for last. He comments, when asked, that they've been dating for three years and planning to build a life together. He presses that love is hard work, alluding that such hard work needs time and patience. Emma can't see how that's worth living for and asks him to give another reason. Agitated, Adam almost runs into a car while trying to cross the road and he indicts Emma for his near-morbid experience. She assures him, with a chuckle, that Free Will had a hand in it, not her. Across the street, he spots Tracy and gives her a hug and a kiss, eagerly complimenting her. He tells her he's been having a tumultuous day and has had her on his mind. She misreads and suspects he's on a guilt trip after flooding the apartment. He asks her what she's doing with her life and she throws him a puzzled look before giving the obvious answer that she's working. He reminds her she wanted to be a yoga teacher and should revive her dream as there's no time to waste. She asks how they'll sustain themselves if she whimsically follows his wild advice to go to India with her yoga mat. He frames her face with his palms and plants a kiss on her forehead, 
promising there's no need to be worried anymore. Tracy presses to know if something happened as he's acting strange, and he takes a seat on an outdoor bench to relay the wild day he's had so far. Tracy picks up on the part where Adam narrates interacting with another woman and she misreads the situation as him wanting her out of the picture, in India, so he can be with his newfound love and his pending fame. Adam deplores there's a big but to his success story, it will be posthumous. Tracy believes he's gone loony and the matter gets worse when Emma approaches them and engages Adam in a back and forth. Emma reveals Tracy can't see her because she's not on her list, and after Tracy has had enough of Adam seemingly arguing with himself, she opines that he should take the job offer. He yields and she pecks him, telling him she loves him before she walks back to work. Emma comments on his lackluster response, revealing he hasn't said I love you back to Tracy in the span of their relationship. Adam notices she drops something and he hurries over to pick it. The fallen piece of paper reveals an application for a recruitment center, meaning Tracy is on a hunt for a new job which Adam wasn't aware of. Emma and Adam continue their stroll with Adam still shaken over Tracy's secret job hunt. Emma offers to be a listening ear if he'd like, then she stops them abruptly to draw Adam's attention to another candidate that could take his place in passing. The candidate is a homeless drunk littering about a trash can. Adam starts to consider it, and Emma reminds him he stands the chance of losing fame, confined to his very ordinary life should he play nice guy again. Conflicted, he laments he isn't even done with his book, but Emma corrects that he's almost done with it and there's time to finish it. Defeated, he asks them to move forward. He leads them to a coffee shop because he's in need of the caffeine to help me cope with his bizarre day. They step in, and Emma states he's a very safe guy. Adam disagrees and Emma will only be convinced after he proves it by asking out the female attendant over the counter. Adam goes for it but gets rejected. He tries to point out the smile they shared before he approached her, but the attendant mentions she was only being polite. Embarrassed, he orders a coffee and joins a snickering Emma on a bench in a corner of the shop. Emma asks him to try again, stating she's fixed the situation. When next he approaches the attendant, Sarah, she'll perceive him as rich and famous. He reluctantly approaches Sarah and she's more receptive, bubbly and full of laughter at his sense of humor. Seeing he has her full attention, he asks for her number which she writes and hands over to him. Sarah asks him to call so she can make up for her earlier hostility. Adam returns back to the bench still very much amused. Emma asks Adam if he's actually going to call Sarah, and Adam replies that he won't because her reception was only because Emma interfered. Emma leans in close, holds his hand, and reinstates Adam is a good guy. She talks about him wanting to have it both ways like confining himself to a relationship even when he entertains the idea of casual relations with other women, and wanting to be a successful writer without paying a price. She lectures he can't have the best of both worlds and points out he's just scared he's not going to experience the spotlight. It would also explain why he's been stalling the book's ending for months. Adam falters then concedes. He decides he'll stop living in fear and safety, and move towards the edge. They leave the shop and excitedly board a bus to a bar that Emma comments smells bad. Adam defends the place, stating they're just there early and it's known to be lively and full with the right activities. Something he knows because he used to be a regular customer some time past. They order drinks, but Adam has to settle for a less extravaganza order after a bad look from the bartender. Adam realizes the bartender can see Emma and questions her about it. Emma reveals the bartender has an open file with her and will be gone by the following week. Adam confirms this likelihood on hearing the bartender cough. Emma informs Adam she's running out of files to close and she'll need him to finish his book. Adam gets sentimental, recalling times he and Tracy would visit the bar. They would talk about his aspirations and the success they wished would follow. Now things have changed with Tracy wanting him to get a job outside his dream. Emma expresses he's no different as she knows everyone to want the very ultimate. She reminds him she's given him a great deal, but he keeps hesitating because he wants to have it all. Adam tries to switch gears and asks Emma how she became a reaper. She sighs loudly and deviates to their plans of getting into trouble. Adam decides to put on a little show by slugging down two shots of liquor. With a raspy voice from a hard swallow, he offers her more of where that came from. Next up is him stealing a kid bike when he could have stolen an adult bicycle. They are at the secluded part of a park with steps, and Emma asks what he plans to do. He announces he'll body hop the steps, pulling off a great and dangerous stunt. Emma doesn't see how body hopping in his 30s makes any sense, maybe when he was 10, but Adam reasons the stunt would have been life-threatening at that younger age. Emma informs him it's no different now, and he realizes he has a free will to death should he hop over those steps with his stolen bike. They walk away, the day gradually darkening to reveal nighttime. They arrive at another park, sit at another bench, and enjoy cones of ice cream and other desserts. Adam comments ice cream dates are cool too and it doesn't always have to be wild activities. Adam starts to warm up to the idea of kicking the bucket soon and asks if word is going to reach the afterlife that he's finally made it. He fantasizes about joining the circle of the elite with the likes of Dixon's. Emma reveals, while sipping from her drink, that Tracy is going to build Adam a museum and Adam gets excited. Emma brings up the body hop stunt and Adam counters with wanting to know how she became the Grim Reaper. She apprehensively picks up her stuff and walks away, asking him to stop being curious about it. 
Adam takes her to a joint called Palais Royale and Emma's response is excitement. She eagerly tries the doors but they're locked up, so Adam hands over his satchel and goes off for a minute. Emma remains standing and waiting until the doors open from within. She lets out a squeal before she's hurriedly ushered in by Adam who asks her to be subtle and stealth. The interior, that was previously enveloped in darkness, has an overhead chandelier lit up, and Emma and Adam are on the dance floor, hands clasped and swaying to a piano tune that leads to a kiss. Slowly, they let go off each other and Adam pleads with Emma to tell him what he needs to know. She starts off narrating how she followed her fiancé for an event overseas. She became a nurse shortly after but a bomb blew up the hospital she'd been working in. She was 26 at the time and there had been someone else working as a reaper with an overwhelming workload. He decided to expand his workforce and recruited her. Adam asks why she took the job especially since she was so young and didn't need to. She tearfully answers she didn't want to part from her fiancé who she presumed would join her soon enough, but he made it through the war and continued with his life. He finally passed 20 years ago and didn't even recognize Emma when she came to be his escort to the next world. Adam still doesn't understand why Emma puts up with the job function if there's no longer much to look forward to. He reasons she could just retire and go lounge in a heavenly mansion. But she reminds him she's never been beyond the gates to know what the actual afterlife entails. What's more is that if she goes beyond the gates, she can't return. The unspoken words are that she's afraid, but Adam etches closer to remind her everyone is afraid. The music has died down when Adam tells her to quit her job immediately. Emma retorts quitting would be convenient for Adam, but he insists quitting will put her out of her torture as she has to come to the terms that she can't live again. He lectures that it's always scary to take the next step, and Emma takes his hand, admitting she's been looking for someone to take it with. She recounts all his qualities that have made her fallen for him and seals it with a long kiss when he tries to play himself down. She reminds him he can't have it all before walking out. Adam walks the streets alone with Jeter Davis I can hold my own playing in the background. He reaches home and calls out to Tracy, apologizing for returning late. Tracy remains cold and inquires about his day with Emma. She complains about having a long day at work then coming home to cook him dinner so they could properly discuss their relationship. Adam tries to explain his day did happen in the way he explained to her earlier, but Tracy can't see his shenanigans being past him wanting another woman. He tries to clarify Emma is deceased so he's definitely not cheating. Tracy starts to throw various questions at him concerning Emma and Adam has no choice but to answer. In his narration, he mentions he danced with Emma and Tracy picks up on that. Her voice breaks as she makes him realize she's been trying to get him to dance for a while, and he's refused. Tracy wants him to come out plain with his true feelings as she believes he's trying to tell her their relationship isn't working. The room gets heated with their back and forth. Adam sinks into a chair, muttering how their relationship won't matter much longer since he's going to pass away. Tracy presses on, asking why he's never reciprocated her I love you's and he bursts out about having too low an esteem as a man to reciprocate. He confronts her about the recruitment center and the documents he sees laying around that she doesn't discuss. She excuses she had some money saved to buy something for herself, but Adam notes she's chosen herself over them as a couple. She blurts out how hard it is isn't to be in her shoes, constantly having to uplift someone that doesn't believe in himself and sees only one vision, and nothing else. Adam asserts that his one vision is all that matters to him as it will prove his sacrifice and dedication will finally pay off. Tracy counters he needs to have a different mindset. He's a writer and should just enjoy writing. She reminds him she's not with him for material love, but he falters, knowing he'll live a life with only one true fan. Exasperated, Tracy opines he leaves if he wants to. He can go be with Emma and live the life he prefers. She returns to the couch and focuses on her laptop, leaving Adam to take his business out of the apartment. Adam takes a bus to a library and proceeds to a shelf. He takes out a book to create space, then stares as if envisioning his own book filling up that space. After a moment, he leaves and finds himself in church. Emma appears beside him and asks if he's praying, and he answers that he's contemplating. He tells her he's not just after the fame, he wants his work to be a reference, something that people's emotions would want to relate with. They reflect, talk, and giggle. Emma's head rests on Adam's shoulder and she calls him an interesting guy. He mentions she's the second woman to have told him that. Emma stands and starts to walk around, so Adam breaks the silence by asking her where she's been since their dance and kiss. She answers she's been making more time for him and didn't want to watch him and Tracy break up. Their conversation leans into the topic of kids. Adam considers the prospect of having a famous kid, but Emma points out his kid would be the famous one, not him. He asks her if she ever wanted kids, and she draws closer to try and sell the deal yet again. It will take a sacrifice but there's a lot to gain from his sacrifice. She asks him to focus on the obvious connection they share as they could take the next step together. Adam succumbs to the fact that her beauty is quite enchanting enough to woo him over. Adam's feet are still in ice waters though, and he wants to be sure he'll indeed become successful posthumously. Emma pulls away from their touch, visibly upset over him always using his head over his heart. She tells him he struggles to believe in himself or anyone else and this makes it hard for people to believe him. Adam counters, but Emma is fed up. She gives him till dawn to make his decision. 
Late into the night, Adam goes to a diner and orders French toast and coffee. He starts to eat his meal dishearteningly then thinks it wise to engage his attendant in conversation. Adam asks the attendant how long he's worked at the diner and the older man reveals 32 years to Adam's shock. Adam wants to know if the attendant is happy and passionate about his job, but the attendant ultimately explains he has a job that pays the bill as life doesn't always give you what you dream for. He goes on to say, the sooner Adam comes to terms with it, then the better. The older man continues to share words of wisdom, making Adam realize a lot of things. Satisfied, he pays, thanks the man, and hurries off. Adam arrives back at the apartment he shares with Tracy, and Emma is waiting at the doorsteps. She tearfully pleads for him to just leave with her without having to speak to Tracy again. Adam insists that he has to speak to Tracy and express his feelings even though he has nothing to offer her. Tracy is still in the living room as if she's been waiting earnestly for him to return. He tells her his time is up and she has to believe him even if she doesn't want to. He finally confesses his love to her and promises it will always be there even when the inevitable happens. Moved by his words, she kisses him and lets him embrace her. When they pull apart, he explains there was a loophole to his death sentence that he thinks he's fulfilled. Emma would grant him life if he found something worth living for and he's decided that's Tracy. If he passes away, then he stands to lose a good thing. Tracy gets giddy and melts into him. He hoists her up and lays her on the couch intending to take things further, but Tracy keeps pulling away, insisting he needs to finish his book as it's his lifelong dream. She also worries about Emma's crush on Adam, and Adams get the message. He'll need to sort things out with Emma before he can fully return to Tracy. Still a long night, and Adam finds a dejected Emma in a corner. He apologizes to her but states he's ready to take the chance and keep living for his passion. Emma tells him he reminds her of her ex-fiancé, eager to live. She, however, doesn't have the final say and he should know he'll meet an untimely end regardless. Adam jolts up in disbelief and questions why he still has to kick the bucket if he has met the conditions needed to give him a second chance. He wonders if Emma is being hard on him because he didn't choose her, but Emma claims her emotions aren't manipulating the final stance. His only option is to finish his book. Adam pleads, but Emma vanishes, leaving him in the wake of a building panic attack. She appears again and promises finishing up will be easy before handing him his laptop bag. They go to a coffee shop and Adam acknowledges her help, as he has just a couple of pages to type. His phone rings and he sees it's Tracy, but Emma wants him to ignore the call and round up the book. He decides to rush home instead, leaving Emma and his laptop behind. They reunite outside the apartment with Emma sadly commenting that he indeed followed his heart. He relays his desire to create lasting memories, and Emma muses over wanting him to take more a risk. She realizes he already has, and it's her turn to do the same. Adam tells her he'll miss her and she wishes him luck on his interview the following day. He replies he'll be giving the interview a pass as he still has a couple of more stories to tell. Emma gives him her signature smile before fading out of his life. 